Um, we're going to talk about some different types of storage devices and how they work and all that type of stuff. And then uh, Andy's going to take over and talk about some backups and some methodologies and all that type of stuff behind that. So again, thank you for attending and uh, let's get started here. If I can advance the screen, there it is. All right, so my name is Bill Hartog. I'm a, a pre-sales engineer here at ByteSpeed. Um, I do have some certifications with Wi-Fi and uh, SAN management and that type of stuff. Designed a whole bunch of different SAN deployments using VMware, Hyper-V, um, you know, anything you can do there. Andy Benson will also be a presenter. He is uh, a man with many hats, as you can see by the slide there at ByteSpeed. Um, does quite a, do, uh, quite a few different things for us. Um, quite a few certifications as well. Works a lot on the switching side with Juniper. Also a lot in the SANs, even more involved than I am and then does a lot with backups and stuff. Um, Veeam is a, is a definite speciality for him. And again, he works uh, very in depth um, in a lot of SAN implementations here at ByteSpeed. We have a SAN implementation that he manages and works in depth with as well. So uh, good, good resources here. He's uh, kind of one of our managed service guys and does a great job. So let's jump right in. Um, the first thing we're gonna talk about kind of on the storage side here is DAV storage. Um, that's gonna be, you can call it direct attached storage, you know, also call it dumb attached storage, depending on what you want to do there. Um, but the true name is direct attached storage. Um, and that's kind of, there's kind of three levels as far as storage devices goes. This is going to be your lower end um, storage device. It's basically just a rack for holding hard drives. Um, even if you think about uh, an external hard drive or something like that, that could be considered, you know, a uh, uh, DAVs device, uh, you know, connected via USB, connected via external SATA or something like that. that that's a DAVs device. In the enterprise, you're normally going to see them connected with a external SAS connection. Um, and a lot of times they are used for uh, the other devices we're talking about, like a, a NAS or a SAN, this will be used to expand. If you ever hear about an expansion shelf or something like that, that's going to be a DAVs device. Um, DAVs devices themselves are pretty dumb, um, as you, as uh, stated there. They're just an extension of local storage, and they don't really have a controller built into them. All of the processing and all that type of, type of stuff will actually be done on the the head unit, or in you know if you do it in a NAS or a SAN, it'll all be done on that main NAS or SAN unit. If you're connected into a server, all the processing and everything is being done inside the server itself. It's just connecting via an external connection, like a, a SAS connection, just like a normal hard drive would, to an external enclosure. It's just an external enclosure for a whole bunch of hard drives. That's kind of what a DAS is. Um, you can't really use them for shared storage. So if you have a device like a SAN, NAS, or server, that's the only device that's going to be able to connect into a DAS normally. It uses a normal SAS protocol or, you know, SCSI protocol or whatever it is to write. So if you have multiple servers trying to write to one DAS device, those protocols are assuming they're alone writing to that those hard drives. So you're going to have, you know, servers trying to write to the same data space, assuming there's no one else writing to it, and that's going to cause all type of problems. So DAS storage devices are not shared, real dumb, and are just extensions of local storage are kind of the, the takeaways from that. Here's just a basic um, look at what uh, what uh, kind of a topology would look like. So you have your, your workstation or your client, um, and then it's connecting into, in this case, a file server. That file server has like a RAID card or a SCSI adapter, which has an external connection to your direct attached storage. Again, the file server there is taking care of all the processing, all the work, and the direct attached storage is just housing um, those hard drives for it, basically. The next kind of tier that we're going to get into is NAS storage. That's network attached storage. Um, these are, are pretty simple units in themselves as well, um, whereas a DAS uses something like um, external SAS to connect. These type of devices are going to connect into your normal data network um, in most cases. So you can you know, plug them into whatever network you want, but in most cases, this will be plugged into a normal network, especially if you're doing file sharing and that type of stuff on it, because you want most devices to be able to access this device. Um, this is this does have a brain in it. So it will have a controller in it, which is basically a 
slimmed down server actually inserted into the unit. It'll have a processor, it'll have some RAM or cache to it, and it will have a probably a small uh, flash device on it somewhere to house a small operating system that actually makes the unit file level aware. So it ha will have a small operating system running on it. You can normally log into it um, and create file shares directly on a NAS. You don't need a file server in front of it doing all the work. This unit can actually present shares on its own. It doesn't need a server to be able to do that. Um, a couple uh, of things about them, they're not normally high performance and they're not normally redundant. Um, like I say, they normally do have that controller or that brain that are in them, but there's normally only one. Um, you can get some with two and stuff like that and add redundancy, but the, the normal NAS is going to have one controller, and if that controller goes bad, you're going to lose connection to the NAS. So because of situations like that, you know, if you're using it for file sharing, if you're using it for backups, if you're using it for non-mission critical archival storage, those are good uses for it, but you do not want to use it for things like mission critical applications um, and files and any type of virtual environment. If you're doing that, you don't really want to use a NAS because there are single points of failure built into a NAS in most cases. And the, the controller that's in them use, usually isn't as beefy as something like when we talk about our SAN, they're not going to be as complicated um, or as strong as something in a SAN device. So you're just not going to get the, the IO and that type of stuff out of them. So that's NAS storage. It's actually very, very simple to set up. Like I say, you can log directly into devices and set up shares and all that type of stuff. It's on your normal network. So unless you're you know, setting permissions and stuff like that, most people on the network are going to have access to it. Um, so NAS devices work great there. And here's a basic setup um, of what kind of the, the NAS would look like in a network. So you have your servers and your clients there. This is just a totally flat network here. And you have your Ethernet switch, and then that connects into the network to tax storage as well. So all those clients and that server can access any shares via your normal network there. Um, that are created on that network to tap storage. So, you know, if you have a, you don't need to, if you want, are only doing like file, files level services, like if you're just using a file server, you don't even need a real server to do that. You can run the file server right from a direct or network attached storage device and, you know, get rid of, get rid of a server in your infrastructure if you're so inclined to do so and it can't do anything else. But if you're just doing file sharing, it can do that for you. Um, so those work well in those cases. And again, not very redundant, um, and those types of things. The next device we want to talk about um, is kind of a SAN device. Um, a SAN is, a, is called storage area network, so calling a single device a SAN is a bit of a misnomer, um, but 99% of the time you're going to run into that anyway. A SAN is the storage device itself, but it's also all of the things that it takes to connect into it. Like we call that the SAN fabric. Um, so that'll be all the cabling and all the switching that will connect into the SAN unit. That's what the, the SAN fabric is. Um, a SAN storage area network has its own dedicated network normally. Now you can do that via flat network by just adding in a couple layer two switches and having a totally dedicated network to only your SAN device. Or you can do some VLANing on existing um, switches and that type of stuff to separate out the network. But a SAN operates on a separate network than your normal day-to-day -day traffic and that type of stuff. Um, it uses block level. So even though this is kind of a higher level solution, it is not file level aware like the the NAS is. Um, it's going to use things like iSCSI and Fiber Channel and those type of protocols a lot closer to what a DAS would do. Um, you know, a DAS uses external SAS. Well, iSCSI is basically external SAS over Ethernet. Um, so those type of things is block level only normally. And again, there are some gray areas in all of these things, but normally a um, SAN is not going to be aware of the files that are on the SAN. It's only going to be aware of the block level data that's on the SAN. So you need a server or something to be able to see the actual files that are stored um, on a SAN device. Um, again, the, the head end server required for uh, visibility and then 
commonly used for like high-end databases, virtualization, mission critical data. SANS are built, are purpose built to have tons and tons of redundancy in them. Um, and we'll kind of go through how they are built and how you'd kind of build out a, a, a SAN network and that type of stuff in a, in a future slide. But just know for that at this point, they are highly redundant. You can get them you can give them tons of performance. Um, you can do them all flash. You could do them with SSD caching. You could do it the old school way and just go with a whole bunch of, of hard drives and stuff. You want 10K, 15K, you know, normal SATA 7200 drives. Kind of up to you as far as you want to build them, but they can be very, very quick, um, faster than even, you know, most local um, storage situations. Um, again, generally more redundant and reliable than a NAS device. Um, and it off, often includes some advanced features. Now, some NASs will have some of these features. Some SANS won't have all of these features. But in general, some kind of um, features will have replication, deduplication, and snapshots. We'll talk about those three because those are kind of big ones that are offered in most SANS. Um, G-duplication is kind of a higher end one, but replication and snapshots at least are in most SANS in this day and age. And we'll talk about what those are here in a future slide. Um, normally a dual controller, like I say, the controller is basically a, a mini server inside the SAN. Um, a SAN is generally gonna have two of them and it's gonna have failover. So if one goes bad, the other one will be able to pick up the slack. That kind of comes into how you design that SAN fabric we talked about, how the switches are connected, how the network cables are all run and that type of stuff. But what should be able to happen is if you have a controller go out, if you have a switch go out, and if you have a server go out, everything can still get to everything. That is the entire purpose of the uh, a SAN fabric and the SAN network in general as as much redundancy as possible for, you know, specifically, you know, what we run into most off of is people running virtual environments, something VMware, Hyper-V, what have you. Um, you know, if you lose a host, doesn't matter, you can boot those VMs up on the other host because the redundancy is built in. You lose a switch in your SAN network, doesn't matter. Those hosts can still go through the other switch that's up and get to the SAN. You lose a controller, doesn't matter. The, the switches that are there are connected into both controllers, so as long as those servers get to the switches, they can get to that, that second controller. So redundancy built in, and that's kind of the name of the game there. And for that reason, it's recommended for mission critical, critical apps and files. And the main reason we see them a lot of times is for production virtual environments, for file sharing and that type of stuff. So that's where those come into play. Talking about the, the, those SAN features that we were talking about, deduplication. Um, deduplication has a lot of kind of magic sauce that goes into it in the background, but Basically what it is, is let's say you're running a VM environment and you have a whole bunch of Windows VMs. Well, those Windows VMs, those Windows files that it's storing or those uh, a SAN technically isn't file level layer like we talk about with the blocks of data, there's gonna be a lot of similar blocks of data because they're all running, let's say Windows Server 2019. Well, Windows Server 2019, if you have five VMs running it, you're gonna have a lot of duplicate data because they're all have at least the, you know, the Windows section of it is gonna be very, very similar between all those VMs, right? A SAN with deduplication will be able to say, hey, I already have that data written elsewhere. All I'm gonna do is put a pointer in at this point in time to go look at that instead of rewriting that data again. So that is what deduplication kind of does. It will save, depending on your, you know, what you're using it for and that type of stuff, it will save lots and lots of space. Um, I think, you know, when you talk to a SAN vendor, they'll usually say like they can, depending on your workload, you know, you can get like 3x data reduction on the low end and, you know, they go crazy high on the high end as far as your data reduction. But deduplication is a method of data reduction and you can actually get some really, really good data savings um, depending on, you know, your workloads and that type of stuff. They work really, really good in virtual environments, less so with like databases and stuff because a database usually isn't gonna have a whole lot of replicated data and all that type of stuff. Stuff. So um, that, that's deduplication kind of in a nutshell, basically a way of reducing data. Replication. Replication is pretty cool. Um, depending on the vendor and stuff, it does vary a little bit and all the bells and whistles that you'll get with it. But in general, if you have two SANs, 
um, replication is basically for disaster recovery. So if you have two SANs of a similar model from the same vendor, normally that's what's required. Um, it will, you can set up one to replicate to a second one that you have at an offsite location. An example of that, uh, the last place I worked had an office in Fargo, North Dakota. They also had an office in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, what they had set up was the, the primary or the production site was in Fargo and Raleigh was the backup site. We had a SAN from the same vendor um, in both locations, same model. And what happened was everything kind of ran in general in Fargo. We did have a few running in, in the Raleigh area too that were running live. But in general, most of the stuff, the production stuff was running in Fargo. The volumes on the SAN were set up every night when after hours it would replicate the data that had been written that day over to Raleigh. So Raleigh had basically a daily copy of what was done, um, you know, or what the data that was written to the Fargo SAN. So if the Fargo SAN ever went down, and this was a virtual environment, so if the Fargo SAN ever went down, we could go over to Raleigh and basically make those replication volumes over there the new active ones. And then we could spin up VMs based on you know those volumes so you know we could have raleigh up even if you know there was a fire or something like that and the whole fargo site was down we would have a replication copy in um raleigh north carolina and of course we'd have to do some networking stuff to make that all work uh, and you know bring everything up properly but the data would be there to bring up um, so that's replication it normally doesn't require any type of third-party software or anything like that it's usually built into the san itself um, and that type of stuff so that um, is, is a good thing to have for disaster recovery purposes. It's not a true backup oopsie because, like I say, it is a, you know, what's on Fargo will be in Raleigh it, when it's scheduled to go. So if someone deletes something accidentally in Fargo right before they leave, well, while they're gone, that data is going to write to Raleigh. And then they come in the morning and said, oops, I didn't mean to delete that. Well, it's too late because that data has now been written to Raleigh. So it's not a true um, backup scenario in that case is more a disaster recovery uh, solution. And now snapshots. Um, snapshots and replication kind of work in concert because replication actually replicates snapshots. But basically a snapshot is a saving a specific time on a volume on a SAN. So if I create a volume on a SAN and it has, you know, a, a VM or something in it, like let's say it's, it has a a file server on it. It's a VM for a file server um, that's running on the SAN. And actually this happened at my previous job as well. We had um, a lady who got a, a crypto or ran or yeah, a cryptoware or ransomware, or whatever it was. Anyway, it she had access to some shares on the file server, which were running on the SAN, um, and it encrypted that file share. Um, so what I had were snapshots that were running every day. And it would take a snapshot, I think, right before work started. So like, you know, I think 6 a.m. or something like that, the snapshot would go off. Um, and then it would take one more snapshot at the end of the day. So I had a snapshot from what, you know, what happened at the end. And if anyone worked late or something like that, I'd have protection there as well. So I'd have some snapshots. And it, again, a snapshot is just kind of a picture of what that volume looks like at that time. It just kind of a, takes a picture of, or, you know, uh, and saves it separately from the active data that's being written. So, uh, you know, I get an email 9 o'clock a.m. saying, hey, something's wrong with my computer. Well, we go over there and she's got ransomware and it's encrypted not only her files, but any share that she had access to. And again, she had some access to some shares on the file server. So what I was able to do is I took the file server down. I was able to say, hey, I have that snapshot from 6 a.m. this morning, sent an email out to everyone and say, hey, sorry, we had a problem. I'm gonna have to restore our share from you know, such and such a date. And you're able to, I was able to shut down the, the file server, take that snapshot and restore it on top of the basics. So basically reverted what had been written from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. back to that 6 a.m. image. And then I was able to bring the unit back up before the ransomware ever hit anything. So yeah, they lost, you know, two hours worth of work or whoever, however long, but we were able to bring that up. That whole process took five to 10 minutes. So very, very powerful in the right 
situations, again, it's not a true backup because it's not in a different location, right? So if you lose the sand, well, you've just lost all your snapshots and everything like that. But it is great for, oops, I deleted something or something like that. You can bring a lot of those back. Um, snapshots will kind of vary in how good they are. Some things will actually give you granular recovery. So you can go in there and basically create a whole brand new volume of that snapshot, give a server access to it, and then you can pull out individual files. So instead of having to overwrite an entire, you know, the, an entire volume, you can just grab files out of it and that type of stuff. There are, are more powerful versions than that, but just know it's a snapshot of that volume at a specific time that you can revert to. And you can keep those along, you know, you can keep those with you for weeks or months or however long, depending on how much storage availability you have, because they will take up storage. So here is kind of a, a quick look at some basic SAN architecture. This one is actually a little bit more advanced because it's got multiple, you know, storage units and that type of stuff and multiple servers. But as you can see, you have your clients, they're connected into the normal local area network, which is connected into servers. Those servers are connected into a separate storage area network and then that connects into the actual, you know, SAN storage device itself. So you need those server front ends to be able to have clients access the SAN there, and the SAN is kind of on a totally separate network. And I'll show you kind of how that storage area network you want to set up redundant and all that type of stuff right here. So designing a resilient SAN solution. Um, so looking at kind of the picture down here, redundant NIC ports on the servers. And you can go crazy with this and you can say, I don't even, I don't want redundant ports. I want redundant cards, right? So maybe you have a onboard NIC and you're gonna add in a second card and you're gonna use one port off of each because if your NIC on your motherboard goes bad, you don't wanna lose connection. Um, and if that card goes bad, you don't wanna lose connection, right? So depending on how you wanna do it, you can do it however you want, but at the minimum you want two NICs or two connections coming off of your servers into at least two switches. So you can see both servers are connected into both switches. So that's entirely redundant. If you lose one of the switches, you can still get to the SAN controllers. So this whole system is designed, if you lose one thing, it's okay, you're not down. Um, so redundant switches, um, redundant NIC ports on the SAN. So you can see the SAN controllers themselves each have redundant NICs as well. So if you lose one NIC on a, a SAN controller, that's not gonna go down. And then on your the SAN controller area over here, that's actually one device just with two controllers. So that's one SAN device with two different controllers in it. And again, those are redundant. If you lose one, it will fail over to the other one. Um, and then also always remember that they're, your SAN, your NAS, your DAS normally, the, again, the DAS won't control the RAID, but all these devices are gonna have some type of RAID running on them. Um, a DAS, you could do like weird JBOD things, but I would not recommend that. But they're gonna have some type of RAID configuration, usually like a RAID 6 or better, um, that's gonna give you the redundancy to lose some hard drives and all those type of things. So when you're designing a network, um, for a SAN, there is a little bit of overhead because you probably are going to get have to get some, you know, new switching um, uh, devices and those type of things. But you just want to build it as redundant as possible, so there is no single point of failure. That's the whole thing with a SAN is trying to get rid of the single points of failure that exist in a DAS device and a NAS device. Um, so that is kind of my my spiel there on the um, storage devices and that type of stuff. Do you guys have any questions? Um, go ahead and put them in the question and answer section or uh, put them in the chat. Um, I'll wait for just a minute or two here and then uh, Andy will take over and we'll go through and do the, to the backup situation. But if you have any questions, let me know. All right, well, that looks pretty quiet out there. Um, I'm gonna bring up uh, Andy Benson. Again, he's gonna go over some kind of backup or you know backup methodologies and kind of the, the thought behind why you do backups and that type of stuff. So uh, Andy, go ahead and uh, take it 
take over here. All right. So first off, I want to go over why we actually back up. Uh, there's been multiple studies that show that if you lose data, like catastrophically, you can't recover it, that you have major consequences. Uh, a lot of businesses lose or close and go under because of data loss. Um, and that's a real, real, real critical thing. Uh, obviously you want to stay employed and you want to stay, stay running. Uh, data loss can be catastrophic. You know, if you're, you know, minor things, you know, probably not, uh, not the end of the world. You know, if, uh, you got a, a sales user lost, lost a picture of their cat, you know, that's what you do. But you know, if, if at bite speed, all of a sudden we lose access to our, our, uh, accounting software database because we had a hardware failure and we don't have backups, that's going to be pretty major. That's going to be a, a you know, a, a system down for probably multiple days, if not longer, uh, especially if I don't have backups. If I don't have backups, we're probably talking at a week minimum would be my, my guess. Uh, so, you know, that's, that is a pretty big deal. So we want to have backups for that. Um, it, it's not an, if something will fail, it's, it's when, whether that's, you know, hardware, software, uh, user error, um, like Bill was saying, ransomware, we got ransomware at bite speed. You know, it happens. People get viruses. Uh, I was able to just restore from backups. I would, we basically did this similar thing that that Bill did, got that user disconnected from from the network, just and instead of doing the snapshot based route, I just went in and restored backups. We caught caught it pretty quick. I didn't have to do a lot of work besides just kind of restoring those files. So you know, it's 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 an if you know that that SAN network that Bill was talking about, it has lots of redundancy in it. You know, it, it's it's great. But if you run that network long enough, something will fail. You know, whether like I was saying, NIC port, cable, switch, host, controller, uh, you know, the SAN itself. Um, you know, a lot of the earlier generation SANs had an issue with the backplane. Uh, that means they just lost all access to their drives. You know, that, you know, depending on, on what happens there, that could be pretty major as well. And ultimately, uh, you know, one of the things that I do like to talk about besides all these, you know, when it's going to happen, you know, things, things closing is how much does downtime cost you? Uh, downtime can be very expensive. We had a, <clears throat> a coworker of ours uh, move to a company in a, another city here. Uh, he became the sysadmin there and learned that they have this one piece of software running on this one server that if that server went down, it cost them over $100,000 an hour to, uh, to, to run basically. So, you know, if they went down, it cost them $100,000. He messaged uh, me, you know, maybe half a year into this or something. And that server went down because of a, a power supply failure because it was an old, old server and they were down for half a day. You know, that's, that's expensive. That's, that's a, a lot of, revenue loss, a lot of money loss there. So when I'm talking to people about pricing backups, you know, out is how much does down time cost you? It's, it's, we want to maintain, you know, everything's running. We want to make sure everything stays that way. And it's, like I said, it's not an if, but a when something's going to happen, you know, it's uh, hardware and computers are all designed by, but humans, humans make errors, you know, nothing's completely infallible. Um, so we want to, we want to keep, keep those backups or at least start uh, getting those backups to help return to operation or, or bring things back up uh, on a failure. All right, Bill, you can go to the next one. Okay. So uh, kind of talking about how we back up uh, the aid, it's been, <laughs> It's been a rule. It's been around for a while. It's a three, two, one rule. Uh, basically, you know, having something is better than nothing. And this would be, this would be the ideal solution. 
so we would have three different copies of our data. We'd have you know, our production data, we'd have our backup data on a separate device, uh, and then one offsite. Uh, so uh, there's our three, three types of data. It, you know, if you do rotating disks, so you have multiple different copies of data offsite, you know, there's, there's nothing stopping you from going overboard, but in the ideal world, uh, having three copies of data minimum is, is best. Uh, Obviously you got production, you're running everything in production. If that goes down, then you got your backups. And then if your building, you know, goes down, you know, fire or something happens where your production and your backups go down, you have something offsite where you can, you know, you don't have to acquire all your data back. You just get your infrastructure back and get back up and running. Uh, the, we will have two types of data or two types of media, uh, you know, the original rule and a lot of people suggest that you have, you know, if you have hard drives in production and you know, your SAN is backed by hard drives, uh, that you use tape as part of your backup, uh, tapes real great. There's nothing wrong with tape. You can store a lot of data on tape. They have very high compression ratios. Um, but in my mind, bare minimum is having two sets of data. Uh, you know, if you can't do the offsite, uh, for whatever reason, having two sets of data uh, so your production is backed up is is a bare minimum. Two different types, uh, you know, would be ideal. At ByteSpeed, I can tell you that we got our production SAN, and then we have a separate server also backed by hard drives. Uh, they are different manufacturer drives. Uh, from uh, production is a Tegile SAN, so that's Western Digital drives, and our backup is Seagate. So we kind of get around that rule uh, that way. Um, and then obviously one offsite, you know, whether that's rotating hard drives, just USB drives, uh, you know, we're talking mechanical drives, not the flash drives. Flash drives will probably burn out uh, pretty quick. Um, copying off, you know, multiple different sites, uh, like Bill was saying with the replica on the SANS, most uh, enterprise software will allow you to at least back up to multiple different repositories. Uh, or have a, you know, like a replication set up. So you back up once to your primary site and then your primary site replicates off site. Uh, and then, you know, with the advent of the cloud, you can back up to, to the cloud, whether that's Azure, uh, AWS, or uh, part of your backup software as well. Um, and that, that, you know, that, that is critical for obviously, you know, failures that involve the whole building. Um, okay, so we can go to the next one. Uh, so now with the advent of ransomware, there's kind of like a plus one. So it's a three, two, one, one rule. Uh, so we still have the, the original first uh, three, two, one is the same. The last one is either air gapped or offline or immutable with the cloud. Uh, and that would help protect against ransomware. Uh, when you know, a couple of years ago when ransomware started becoming big, uh, I was reading a horror story where a user uh, on Reddit had, had backups. They, they got ransomware, uh, but their backup server ended up getting infected. And instead of uh, encrypting everything, uh, it just deleted everything. Uh, so ransomware has been known to delete your backup files. Uh, you know, at, at a minimum, it would take take a while, depending how much your storage. At a minimum, it would encrypt your backup files if your if your backup server, uh, you know, got that ransomware. Uh, depending on you know your software, Veeam runs on on Windows, so you know if it's a if it's a dedicated appliance or running on Linux, you you know your the ransomware attack surface on your backups might be might be less, uh, but having something offline um, or air gapped uh, is kind of starting to, uh, to add to, to this rule. Uh, with AWS or Azure, you can make them immutable. Uh, so that basically means that once, once your files are up in the cloud, the software will essentially check a box for you and you can't actually delete those files until you uncheck those box. So if, if you're connected to the cloud for whatever reason, ransomware gets in, ransomware can't actually go and delete that stuff um as well so that that is kind of an addition into the three two one rule um 
and it, it really does help with protection protection against ransomware ransomware is costs a lot of money to uh, a lot of different people i'm sure you know we uh, everybody remembers uh, the NHS in Great Britain getting ransomware, the national health system, and they hey, had to pay, I think, I think it got their backups, if I recall correctly. They had to pay a lot of money to get their, their data back. All right, so we can go to the next one. Okay, so now that we've kind of discussed on how, you know, the best case minimum scenario of implementing backups, what do we do for disaster recovery, right? Uh, so we got our we got our production data, we got our backup data, and we you know say we we were connected to the cloud, we we're replicating to the cloud. So we always want to plan ahead. There's no point of having these backups if we don't plan ahead at all. Uh, in a complete disaster, uh, catastrophic failure, if you don't have a plan, you're going to be flying by the seat of your pants, and it's going to be stressful and it will most likely uh, take longer to recover. So always plan ahead. Um, big thing with your backups is determine what is mission critical. So that's obviously the, the files, uh, counting software, you name it, uh, that is mission critical. If you're running a Windows update or Windows Server update services, the WSS server, so you can manage your updates, you know, probably don't need, that's not mission critical. I know at Bytespeed, I chose not to replicate that to the cloud uh, because I have limited space on the cloud. So I can just go and if, if we have a complete failure, I can recover everything that is mission critical and we don't have updates for a week until I get either change the policies or, or I re-implement and do WSS server. You know, that, that's not mission critical. I can implement, implement that. Uh, once everything's back up and running on uh, my downtime and that's not going to actually affect, or affect business, uh, you know, running, running actual business. Um, so determining what's mission critical, especially with, with what, uh, you know, if you have storage constraints or monetary constraints, uh, we want to be able to recover the, the data that is going to allow us to come back up and running and make money again. Uh, so, uh, we also want to know what our recovery point objective and recovery time uh, objective. So, a little, little explanation of that. Um, recovery time, kind of, kind of self-explanatory. That is how much time uh, it would take for recovery. That's the time that you're down. The recovery point of objective is uh, the time between your backups and... Uh, you know, say they run 24 or every 24 hours or, or, you know, once in the morning, once in the evening, you know, that, that is the time between the backup and how much data can be lost in between. Uh, and that, that, that'll be, you know, kind of more of a management, uh, interaction with management and trying to figure out, you know, how much, how much does it cost to recover this data? How much does it, uh, cost to back it up and kind of get to a point of, uh, kind of consensus and being able to back up the data that you need and then recover it kind of like, you know, that, that WSUS data, you know, we don't need it again. Um, we have by speed back up once a, once a night. And then we also use snapshots at on our SAN kind of as an example, um, our, you know, recovery time objective is pretty low, uh, just due to the software that we use. We, we do use Veeam. Um, and that, you know, depending on the failure does allow us to recover pretty quickly. Um, and then obviously create a, a backup plan or, or a recovery plan where if, you know, everything fails, uh, or something fails, you can recover it. Um, you can, it's, it is a, a plan that, you know, multiple people know, and it, it's testable. You can go through and test it monthly, um, have a plan to, to recover. Uh, especially if, if, uh, you know, a complete catastrophic failure of your, of the building, you know, tornado goes through bite speed. There are multiple people that have, that know this backup plan. So if, if I'm not available, uh, somebody can go and start the recovery procedure. All right, Bill, we'll go to the next one. Okay. So, uh, we want to test backups, right? The, like I was saying, it's kind of pointless to have backups and, and spend this money on backups if we don't test it. 
you can generally the the software or hardware or appliance uh, will will tell you or, or warn you have an option to you know email you or, or some other way to let you know for failures so if you if you get a failure you know you should probably fix it right away that's exactly what i do if i come in the morning i see that our backups didn't work properly it doesn't matter what i'm doing you know if i got a call scheduled i will postpone that call uh nothing is more important than making sure our backups run properly uh like i was saying it could be software tests um veeam does have the capability to go through and check some all of your data and it can do a health check on a schedule that you want. And that helps check for data corruption, uh, bit rot, uh, hard drives will have on occasion, a bit will flip on, on your desk because uh, they're magnetic, you know, uh, either, either through interference or, you know, a, uh, something or, a, or, you know, a block just failed, you know, that part of the disk just failed and, you know, software checksumming can detect that corruption and, and, and at least notify you of an issue. Obviously, if you are storing your backups on something, it should have, like, like Bill's saying, a, a RAID, RAID of some sort, kind of like your SAN or your NAS. Uh, probably a RAID array that's going to uh, allow for more than one hard drive failure. Uh, so, you know, start, that would start you at RAID 6. Um, and, uh, you know, we just don't want our data for our backups to get corrupted because if we, you know, if we have to recover that data, it's going to recover corrupt data. Um, and then test. So we want to always, always test. Uh, a, if you don't test, um, you're kind of back in, you know, not really having backups. Uh, you can do uh, software-based tests with certain software. Uh, you can boot up your virtual machines. Um, it can do checks, maybe potentially run a custom script that you want against against your virtual machine, and then shoot you out a report. Uh, some backups uh, vendors support that. Um, at a minimum, uh, you should, you know, at least probably monthly or or, or whatever you you determine is best. Uh, not not restore to production, but restore to some sort of test bed. Um, make sure you can see your files, everything's working as expected, because again, if, if that something fails and your data is corrupt or it didn't back up properly, uh, you're, you're in hot water. You're not going to be able to, you, you could lose your data just because even though you have your backups, your backups are corrupted, right? So always test. We don't want a uh, failure of our backups to, uh, cause issues trying to recover. Uh, an example I like to use is uh, we had, we were working with one of our customers. They, they went down, uh, they weren't monitoring their production and they had an issue in their production and they weren't monitoring their backups. So their backups were a week old. Um, and then on top of that, it, it was just a, everything just kind of failed all at once. It was a very, you know, stressful time for, for them, they had a network issue. So it, it, it took a long time to restore that data. Uh, and unfortunately they, they never tested this stuff and they actually didn't, weren't able to restore that data. Unfortunately, uh, it took too long and eventually it just failed out. Uh, and there was not really a way to kind of recover that data. So always test, always monitor your stuff. Uh, we don't want you to, you know, spend this money to have the backups and then it, it doesn't work because you're, you know, something failed on your backups. It's, you know, your backup hardware, you know, whether you're, you're running it on, on a dedicated appliance or another server, something is going to fail. So that's why we have our data in multiple places. Um, and then we want to want to test recovery. And if you do have your, uh, your data, you know, in cloud or rotating USB disks or tapes, you know, something offsite, uh, you will want to test the restore uh, and test that, that backup as well. Um, so you'll have, you want to test your data on, on your, your primary backup device and then your secondary backup or tertiary, you know, how many ever devices, what, 
you got set up, uh, you'd always want to test. And that is about it for me, um, unless you guys have any other questions. All right, yeah, go ahead and type in chat or the question action uh, answer section and uh, we'll get those answered. One thing on backups too, um, they can turn you into a, a zero or a hero kind of thing. So if you have great backups and you know someone knows they did an oopsie, you're the hero because you can recover that. Whereas if something goes down and you can't get it up, now you're you know a zero because well what are you doing? Why don't you have a backup of that? So it's kind of a, a a big thing that end users see is you know are you are do you have a good backup or not? And that, that can make a big difference as far as how people see how the network is running and all that type of stuff. Definitely a visible thing to the end users. Whereas some of the things the hard work that we guys do if everything's working correctly, they never know about it. Backups are a thing they can definitely, if you're doing them right, they'll know you're doing them right when an oopsie happens. And uh, I don't see any questions here. So I think uh, we'll, we'll kind of end the session here. I think it, thanks everyone for attending and uh, have, a, have a great day and a great weekend, everyone.